Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar from Neuristics. Um, the topic today is um, COVID-19, uh, our favorite this year <laughs> in 2020. Um, uh, we, uh, the, uh, we thought that this uh, webinar um, could add a new perspective or different lens for how you can uh, think about what has happened um, during the last uh, four or five months. Um, just to set a little bit of a context uh, before we dive in. Uh, this webinar is not data heavy. Um, you are bombarded with a lot of data about um, uh, CFR rates, about patient cases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are focusing more on helping explain how decisions were made and using behavioral science, try to um, better understand the human decision-making that has taken place at almost every level of the society. Uh, we're gonna take a, a number of different stakeholders like, the, like consumers, uh, government, media, et cetera, to, to better understand what decisions they made. Uh, maybe not all of the decisions, I'll just there all day long <laughs> if we did that, but uh, what decisions they made, uh, at least important ones, and what um, explanations for their decisions uh, come out of behavioral science. So that's uh, just um, um, some context for what you're about to see over the next uh, 40 some minutes. Um, we, I see uh, people are coming to um, join the webinar, but just um, out of respect for everyone else's time, we'll continue and uh, uh, people will catch up. Just a little bit of introduction first. Um, I am Gaurav Kapoor, I'm the president of Neuristic. Um, this webinar is brought to you by Neuristics. Um, Neuristics is, a, is an organization that has become famous in the last uh, uh, less than 10 years. Um, it has grown from a startup to becoming a, um, a well-known um, um, organization focusing in the area of using behavioral science and artificial intelligence to optimize messaging for brands all over the world. Um, a lot of the work we do is in pharmaceutical and healthcare industry, uh, but we partner with um, companies um, in other industries, in financial services, consumer goods, et cetera, as well. Um, and um, our focus, uh, we grew out of um, a, a, a passion for behavioral science um, and then IP that has um, led to, um, you know, all the products that we have developed. I personally, I just think of myself as a behavior science enthusiast. Um, and uh, the way I'm trying to use this science uh, is to try to uh, remove as much as possible biases from my own decision making. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens in life. Um, uh, it's pretty much guaranteed that the 91 participants on this call so far uh, pretty much all of us are using um, biases and other um, erroneous ways of decision making in life. Um, we may not want to uh, think like that. Uh, we probably wouldn't admit to doing that either, but we do. Uh, and um, um, there is a way to try to overcome many of these. Um, just kind of hack your own decision making and try to get better over time. That's been my focus for the last many number of years. But today's focus is to understand how um, a lot of people make decisions uh, erroneously or irrationally during the time of this pandemic. So let's dive in. So the goal is to use science to explain how America behaved irrationally during this pandemic. And um, in order to do that, let's do a little bit of very short on what behavioral science is. There's a lot of different kinds of people here uh, from different backgrounds. Some are experts in behavioral science, other might be a little bit new to it. So here goes. Behavioral science is a field of research which at this point in time has won multiple Nobel prizes. Um, this field of research has helped us understand how human beings make decisions using mental shortcuts. That's the simplest way to understand what behavioral science is. How do people behave? They behave, uh, their behavior is a result of whatever decisions they make. And the decisions they're making are, as a, uh, are a result, almost all of the decisions they're making are a result of mental shots that they're using to make decisions. Over time, 30 some years, hundreds of specific mental shortcuts have been identified 
through academic research. And they've been given names, they've been studied in more detail to see how they impact decision making. And, and now over time, we have actually also learned that many of these shortcuts are biases or cognitive errors or judgmental errors in decision making, et cetera. And because of our need to make quick based decisions, we are now also known to be making bad or as economists like to call it irrational, downright irrational decisions. So we're going to use it, uh, behavioral science to, to explain irrational decisions made during COVID. Let's take a, a one heuristic first, or one method that has been studied and has been shown to influence human decision-making to better understand how behavioral science works. Uh, and then we'll jump into the actual heuristics and biases that have been, um, that, that we believe have driven decision-making related to COVID. So let me introduce a bias to you that once I introduce it, you'll know it exists because you even have probably used it yourself or you know people who use it all the time. The bias is called attentional bias. What does that mean? Sometimes we make decisions based on the fact that we are paying much more attention to emotional imagery than rational facts. And if the emotional imagery is even even kind of personally relevant to us as, as an individual, now we become even more disproportionately driven by personal, that imagery, emotional imagery. And there could be a lot of support or even contradictory facts that we should be paying attention to as well, but we don't, and we kind of jump to, jump to a decision. Now, there are times when this way of decision-making is, is possibly a good way of decision-making. You know, if you, if you fostered a pet because of any attentional bias-based decision, you might have saved a pet's life. Uh, you know, you can say that was not a bad decision, but there are many other times when you could be making irrational decisions as a result of this bias also. Let's take a couple examples on how this bias affects many of us, maybe not all of us, but many of us. Some of you may remember this, um, in 2015, there was a um, there was a interesting story in the news about how a dentist from the U.S. killed this majestic lion in Zimbabwe. The lion was called Cecil, and there were pictures of the lion before he was killed, and then pictures of the hunters, including this gentleman who's the dentist, uh, posing with the lion. And it was like, it went around the world. <laughs> it was, it, people were up in arms. Um, they, they were so uh, disgusted by the fact that he killed this majestic beast um, and they should not be allowed, et cetera, et cetera. People picketed his practice and his house. He literally had to flee to Mexico to get away from everything. There was an investigation started in Zimbabwe. Eventually nothing came out of it because the, the, the hunt was legal. Now we're not here to discuss the ethics of the hunt, et cetera. That's not the point here. The point here is on the right hand side are some that you could also have paid attention to. Maybe in some way, some, somehow, somewhere in life, you might have been exposed to those facts. If you, if you are into wildlife, et cetera, you might have been exposed to them, or maybe not. But certainly the, the people who um, are looking out for the welfare of, the, uh, of lions are putting these facts out there. But it would be safe to say most of us have never thought about these facts. We probably wouldn't even know the extent of uh, how much uh, damage has been done over time. All those facts could not achieve the goal that this one image or, or a set of images achieved. This is an example of attentional bias. Now, let's take another example of attentional bias. Now becomes even, this one was already kind of serious, now become even more serious. I deliberately didn't say anything um, and paused for a few seconds to let you read what was on the Where did your eye go 
where did your attention go? Did you read any of the facts on the right hand side? Or were you fixated on this picture of this little four or five year old who had washed up dead on a pristine beach in Greece many years ago? This is also an example of attentional bias. That picture brought more attention around the world to the suffering of people in Syria as a result of the civil war than almost any other facts that could have been or had been put out by so many other organizations around the world. Not that we don't care about it, we do, but how we actually behave is driven more by, on this topic at least, by this one attentional bias inducing image, it could achieve way more impact than almost all of the statistics and data combined that had been put out up to that point. So now that you kind of know a little bit about, this is one of hundreds of different heuristics and biases that have been discovered through behavioral science research. And we're going to use 19 of them today. <laughs> so we'll go through them efficiently to help explain how decisions were made in COVID. One such bias is attentional bias, which is what we walk through. We're gonna look at five stakeholders, government, consumers, hospitals, and the medical field. We also look at news media and perhaps even academic experts who were involved in advising policymakers and decision makers during this pandemic. So let's jump right in. Um, you're going, we're going to discuss um, how one heuristic at a time. The first set will go through government first. I'll explain the heuristic and then I'll explain the impact on how it possibly drove decision making. And the, this is a US centric discussion. So every country uh, actually makes the pandemic quite differently and um, uh, the heuristics might be different. Um, this is a US centric discussion. The first heuristic we're gonna explain is diffusion of responsibility. Um, the word or the name of this heuristic is pretty telegraphic. What it means is when we're alone, we take much more responsibility of tasks that need to get done. But when we are with other people, when many people are involved, you know the phrase too many cooks in the kitchen type of phrase, we tend to diffuse responsibility thinking that someone else is taking care of it, right? They're thinking the same thing as you are, and therefore nobody ends up taking care of anything. Uh, that's obviously the extreme case scenario of diffusion of responsibility. Um, you might have even heard of the concept of bystander effect, where hundreds of people watch somebody being beaten or killed you know, by the roadside and they didn't say anything, they didn't call the cops. Uh, those are extreme forms of diffusion of responsibility. During the COVID pandemic, this heuristic was most visible in the lack of coordination between federal, state, and local governments in the US. Even very simple things that are literally most basic things that one needs to get prepared as quickly as possible, infectious community-based uh, uh, pandemic were kind of bungled, if you will, because uh, not completely because of, but in large part because of the diffusion of responsibility. And this one quote pretty much says it all. Yeah, for many, many of you, you're reading this quote, you'll recognize who said it <laughs> and when you read it and whether you chuckled or you sighed or whatever you did when you read it. Different people could have had different response. What we've been telling people from directives from the CDC for weeks now, that if you start that, stay home. Um, this came out of Georgia, if you remember. And this was in March, <laughs> two months after Wuhan had already gone through a major um, epidemic at that point in time. So the inclusion of responsibility heuristic played a very big role in how even basic things like test kits, PPE, PPE and, and, and just basic guideline and communications to the public were suboptimal during the pandemic. 
Let's look at the next one. This heuristic is called escalation of commitments. Let me introduce uh, how the heuristic influences decision-making at, at, in general or at broad first, and then we'll talk about how it influenced decision-making during the pandemic. Um, escalation commitment means human beings often make a dec decisions based on the idea that when they have choices to either take baby steps and make small, small incremental decisions and increase or escalate their commitment, versus making one big commitment and making one big decision, they, they find themselves much more comfortable making a series of small decisions and slowly escalating their commitment. What they don't realize that many times, if you add up the small commitments they make over time, A plus B plus C plus D, it ends up being more than the, the one big commitment that they should have made and they didn't want to make and they got nervous about making that big commitment, all those small commitments actually add up to more than that. And this is something that is really, um, uh, we saw this come to life, this heuristic um, influence decision making, especially in New York City or New York, New York City and state, if you will. If you look at CDC's playbook on community spread infectious disease management. One of the key tenets is early and aggressive action is critical. Whether it's testing and contact tracing, or even before you get to the point where that becomes important, just prevention of the spread uh, through public education awareness, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes, um, it becomes really important. And for a variety of reasons. I'm sure the people who ended up behaving this way had a reason for doing so, but eventually what happened was escalation of commitments uh, drove a lot of decision-making during the pandemic in New York City. And as a result of that, New York paid the price in a big way. Um, school closures were not announced until March 16th. Even then, a uh, broader shelter in place was not put in place and California had already done that. Um, March 22nd is when the shelter in place was announced. And even that was very kind of soft pedaled, et cetera. Like, you know, many things were allowed to be open. Then the pause order was extended to April 6th. Then it was extended to April 16th, then to May 14th, you get the point. So, and, and you could create a timeline of how um, how things were basically, how things evolved. But the you, don't, you wouldn't even need to map the whole thing out. You can see the escalation of commitments rather quickly versus some other countries where uh, they jumped on it right up front and, and, um, and made bigger, bolder decisions and commitments like Taiwan uh, were able to actually you know, they, uh, come out of the pandemic in a much better place. Continuing the theme of commitments, the third heuristic that influenced uh, government decision making in the US is commitment bias. What does that mean? That's also reasonably telegraphic in that we tend to, we feel the internal psychological pressure to defend commitments we have already made in the past. We don't wanna admit to the fact that, sorry, I was wrong when I said that, and now what I'm saying is right. <laughs> what is he gonna say about me? You know, was I right back then? Was I, am I right now? Am I never right? You know, am I always dilly-dallying or wishy-washy? Uh, those are all things that come up uh, in your mind, and because of that, you basically double down on, on um, you know, if you've made a bad commitment rationally, you should just admit that and acknowledge it and move on, but you don't. The White House Coronavirus Task Force, it's, at this point in time, it's pretty clear it struggled with commitment bias heuristic. Whether they were making these commitments because of, um, um, because of uh, uh, partisan politics or whatever the reasons might have been, it doesn't really matter. Um, the actual commitment bias is what actually drove a lot of miscommunication, sending mixed signals to the public, which is already very confused, 
Um, and, and if leadership is basically not clarifying things for them and literally holding them by the hand and leading them, there's, there's a lot of potential for bad decision making to, to occur in the society. Whether it's from a early days, it's a hoax, it's no different from the flu. Don't wear masks, they can cause more harm. Wear masks, uh, you know, uh, hydrochloroquine, it's, it's, it's a miracle cure. It's, it's, uh, it can be even good for prophylaxis, uh, or no, it's not good for prophylaxis, it, but it's actually good for treatment. Many, many examples can be traced um, on if you've already made a statement, if you've already made a commitment, verbal or otherwise, or monetary commitment, now suddenly you have a need to kind of want to keep justifying it. Anchoring effect. Number four heuristic, uh, influencing the government. Anchoring effect means sometimes we keep using old anchors to making new decisions. These are anchors that might have been good anchors to use either a long time ago or up to a certain point, but now they should not be used or they're not relevant to the type of decision you're trying to make now. But somehow or the other, they're so ingrained in our mind that we basically can't get rid of them or we can't refresh them or reboot, do a reboot on them. So the anchor of COVID-19 being compared to flu or the influenza is a really confounding anchor. If you really want to use that anchor in the right way, you would have to compare every time you're referring to influenza or comparing, the right way to compare would be the first four months of influenza epidemic in 1917 to the first four months of the, of the COVID-19 epidemic now. But that's not what has been done. That's actually almost never been the focus of, of, of most of the news that you have read. Uh, you know, you may find maybe one article or two here and there about this, but most of the, um, uh, the conversation has not been about that. It's just from the get-go, some of the narrative that was floated about comparing, oh, this is just like a bad flu. We have bad flu seasons. And as a result of that, we can just, um, uh, you know, we can just uh, think of this as a bad flu. That um, comparison became an anchor, call it an incorrect or irrational anchor. Um, and that anchor is now very difficult to shake off. The right anchor is not even being used. Perhaps none of these, the influenza may, one could argue, should not even be used as an anchor at all. This is a infectious disease in and of itself. If you want to compare it to anything, compare it to other coronaviruses. There are four or five coronaviruses that already exist in the society, and this is another form. Um, and we can have a conversation about how they have impacted you know, health, uh, healthcare and mortality around the world. This anchor has now really sparked, uh, uh, and, and the debate is still ongoing about excess mortality of the flu versus COVID and so on and so forth. It's creating unnecessary confusion, um, um, definitely among the public, who's not as, as, as um, you know, doesn't have time or, or the bandwidth to appreciate all the details, um, and even among uh, experts in this field. Source credibility bias, number five heuristic. Um, again, the name gives you a hint. Basically, you um, tend to reject statements from a source that you believe is, is not, um, you know, you, you don't like that source. Um, uh, for whatever reason, you are biased against whatever they say. Um, you have a hard time, the old saying, you know, don't shoot the messenger. You have a hard time separating the message from the messenger, if you will. So that's, um, that's the simplest way to understand source credibility bias. This bias um, manifested itself in two different ways um, in how it uh, influenced government decision making, especially at the White House level. Once again, going back to the CDC playbook, or it's not just CDC, you can look at any uh, infectious disease pandemic management playbook, pretty much they all say the same things. Um, one of the things they say, which by the way, Seattle did do, but the rest of the country for the most part didn't, um, is you put the scientists out in the front and make them the face of public relations during pandemics. Why? Because there is evidence from past when this was not done, you see much poorer public 
it's an adherence to what the scientists are telling you um, and what they're asking you to do or what they're what community what what they're trying to what information or knowledge they're trying to kind of communicate to you um, and this this is one source it's it's in essence if within the white house um, there are source credibility bias issues at the personal level or organizational level or whatever it might be and because of that, one of the most basic rules of the playbook is not being followed in one of the more kind of, you know, um, uh, really bad pandemics in almost 100 years, then there's going to be a cost to pay. Um, another way this actually also manifested itself is if, even if you basically um, um, buy, even if you say China's data is not credible, China is in bed with the WHO, and China is manipulating data, you know, millions of these um, uh, cell phone users have just disappeared, whatever, it, it, you know, it, you, can, you can go anywhere on the spectrum um, in terms of rejecting all of this data or accept some of it, all of it. Um, put that aside, just the fact that Wuhan is larger in population than New York City it was in the middle of winter or Chinese New Year, which is a period of heavy travel. It was the first major outbreak, every which way you look at it. The fact that, that they were able to manage and contain it in the amount of time they did, there's gotta be some lessons learned from that. That should have been applied everywhere, not just in New York City, they should have been applied everywhere. Did they make mistakes? Of course they did. They, they probably made lots of mistakes too. Would they admit to them? Of course they won't. <laughs> they wouldn't admit to them any more than we would admit to our mistakes. But, um, but that doesn't mean there weren't really valuable lessons uh, learned and throwing the baby out with the bathwater type of uh, uh, metaphor that you have heard might have actually heard also uh, things that could have been done differently. Um, the last one for government, I believe, accountability bias. If you feel accountable to someone, you suddenly will start making decisions simply because they are much more justifiable to whoever you feel pressure to, you know, to, to, you know, to be accountable to. You may, in fact, excuse me, be making bad or downright irrational decisions, but because they're justifiable to them, to the other party, you just run with it. If you look at the stimulus packages that many countries have put out, there's a structural difference between the stimulus package that US has put out so far. They're trying to change it now. Uh, in fact, there were literally this week, there's been some good developments on it. But so far, the package that has been put out, much more of the money in the US has been given out to or is supposed to be given out to directly to families. Now, on the face of it, it makes all the sense in the world, right? Like it's like, you know, it's sort of putting money in the coffers of corporations who are just going to, you know, like, uh, you know, hoard it or whatever. We should give it directly to the people. How can we disagree with that? In other countries where they've actually given the money to organizations and under the condition that you are supposed to use this money to protect your payroll and make sure jobs are not lost, the joblessness rates in those countries are much lower. And, um, and the PPP portion of the stimulus package is supposed to do that also, but it's, it's only a third of the package. So, and even that has been, you know, like it ran out very quickly. Lots of businesses couldn't get it. If you didn't have a bank relationship, you couldn't get it, et cetera, et cetera. Both Democrats and Republicans agree on this stimulus structure. And to what extent did accountability bias play a role? Every, every senator, every House member is basically representing a constituency. That's where they're from. If he's looking out for his or hers, I have to do the same for mine. And every would look like a star if they made sure that my people got a check. If they didn't, they're going to get eaten alive <laughs> by in their constituencies also. So it was both, both the upside and the potential downside penalty, but nobody wanted, would have wanted to back off. And everybody is basically 
kind of you know being heavily influenced by accountability bias and potentially making a suboptimal decision uh, as far as the the the, the well being of the country the whole country is concerned. So those were six heuristics that have led or influenced decision making in interesting ways at the government level. Now we're going to look at the same thing at the consumer level. Let's look at what in, uh, heuristics have driven decision making for consumers. Um, scarcity effect. Uh, the, again, the name gives you an idea. Sometimes we fall into the trap that if something seems to be scarce and is going to run out, quickly, we want it more. Even if we don't need it, <laughs> we, we, we can live without it right now or ever, forever. Uh, Disney has utilized this heuristic really well with the Disney vault. Uh, you know, this, this movie is going into the Disney vault for the next 100 years. So you better buy it. Otherwise, your kids will never forgive you, right? Um, but this scarcity effect heuristic, you know, yes, as a marketing lever, you know, this offer is running out, only two days left, all those things you see. And, you know, many times you see through the facade and you don't fall for it. Other times you do um, put the marketing applications aside, uh, the scarcity effect dynamic that was created uh, during the pandemic that consumers literally kind of snowballed it has thrown the entire grocery manufacturing and retailing industry into one could call unnecessary chaos. As it is, many, many American households have more product in their basements and pantries and garages that they can use, <laughs> right? They, they could, in fact, I would challenge most of the people who are on this, on this call to not buy anything new for the next whatever, pick weeks, it could be four, six, whatever weeks, and just deplete the inventories in your home and you probably still would be okay, right? You wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't run out of things. So as it is, that's the baseline. On top of it, because of the news articles, because of going to the store and finding empty shelves, et cetera, et cetera, people just went crazy and stockpiled massively. Many, many different things that they possibly didn't even need, almost like panic buying. It's going to take them months to work through these stockpiles, uh, which now throws a complete monkey wrench into, into like predicting demand in the, in the CPG industry, both for the retailers and the, and the manufacturers. They've done pretty well because they sold out with everything, right? Walmart is up 7%, Target is up 8%, whatever the numbers are for now. But what will happen in the next few weeks and months is gonna be like, you know, really interesting to see. Um, there might even be very irrational behaviors if you bought, forget for perishables, even if you bought certain things that will expire, you know, in months or whatever, people, consumers might be throwing product. They may have bought store brands because that's all that was available on the shelves and they don't even want to use store brands or they don't want to use a certain brand. They'll be throwing that. Uh, lots of irrational behaviors. Uh, and then there could be a complete opposite of, you know, psychology of shopping in the next months where now everybody is becoming a penny pincher. All the branded um, manufacturers have to figure out how to do value messaging, how to actually create promotions that don't deplete margins. It's a one could call a lot was artificially induced um, a panic in, in the grocery industry that all, a lot of it because of scarcity effect. Most people did not need to buy what they bought in bulk at that time. Very, very few might have needed to, but most probably didn't. And now the, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, companies are going to be kind of paying the price of that. Information bias heuristic, um, how it affected consumers. This heuristic basically means that sometimes we seek more information, even if it doesn't help us make better decisions. In fact, there are times when having more information leads to worse decisions or no decisions whatsoever at all. In business, we all know of analysis paralysis um, and things like that. But at the consumer level, who doesn't think of, uh, you know, who's not literally analyzing spreadsheets and whatnot, even then, um, in the world that we live in now and how information is shared, um, if you think about it, the only real information that one needs to come out of this pandemic at the individual level, just think about yourself only and your family, immediate family, 
the really only information you need is the information that you already had, the information that was taught to you in primary school, the information that totally makes sense to anybody. You almost don't even have to teach it. In fact, even if you didn't wash your hands, even if you didn't sanitize your hands, as long as you don't touch your hands to your face, you will probably still come out. <laughs> you'll certainly come out alive uh, after, uh, through this pandemic, but you'll still come out. You wouldn't have fallen sick. You wouldn't have been in a mess. And if everybody in the society did that on their own, you may not even have to take drastic measures of shutting down the society or shutting down the economy, things like that. And there are countries who actually have shown that. Hong Kong is one of them, Singapore to a large extent, Taiwan, there are many countries who have done that, um, where the public literally just took it in, 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 like, you know, pardon the pun, in their hands, the matter in their hands, and, uh, you know, they, they didn't shut down the whole society, but they all behaved individually, they all behaved the way they should have been, and they, they basically used the most important information which they already had and didn't let them get carried away by all the other information that has been floating around. Um, next heuristic that has affected, uh, affected decision-making uh, for consumers. It's called Dunning-Kruger effect. Sounds fancy name, but the idea is simple. This effect explains how the most competent people think they barely know anything and there is so much to learn, I'm barely scratching the surface. So, you know, in the, in the like later years of, uh, if you were to talk to Albert Einstein, which I happen to do, no, just jo joking. Um, but if this happens with almost any expert, the more you know, the more you realize what you don't know, or you don't know a lot. And the opposite is also true, which is the, the very little you do know, uh, or if you are really not competent on a given subject, it's very easy to actually jump to a conclusion that, um, that, you know, yeah, this is not that hard. This is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I can understand it. You know, what's, what, you know, like, what, what's the big deal? So much so that you even feel comfortable that I can even teach other people, you know, how to do this. The last pandemic was in 2009. Most of us on this call were not kids in 2009. But I challenge any of you to remember anything from that pandemic. Now, presumably a lot fewer people died from that pandemic around the world, but it wouldn't have been called a pandemic. It, it, had, it wasn't wide reaching. And, and, and let me remind everyone, it was in 2009, only six or whatever months after the 2008 crash that brought the entire world down, <laughs> financial crash. So, and even then the impact was nowhere close to what it is now. Some of that can be explained by Dunning-Kruger effect. One thing that has changed very substantially since 2009 is how almost every person in the world has become a broadcaster of news and information now, and which was not true even 10 years ago. And now, while scientists, Fauci, Merckx, all these people, they're holding back their words because they don't want to say something which they think might have, might kind of mislead people or whatever. Um, and, and you would presume that, you know, they know everything. While they're not saying stuff or they're holding back or being careful, consumers are putting up leaked research papers about seroprevalence in LA County, right, on their Facebook pages or WhatsApp groups or we. They don't even know what seroprevalence is, or <laughs> neither do they have the bandwidth to actually understand it. But because the media enables that way of behaving, it has essentially impacted. Uh, it's almost like everybody has become a, an expert uh, and is broadcasting expertise now. Um, risk compensation, next heuristic. This is also consumers. Risk compensation means that we tend to, strange behavior that we sometimes display, when we think that things are getting better, the like perception of safety improves or increases, we suddenly start taking on greater risk, which is one could argue rationally the exact opposite of what we should be doing. If things are getting better, then you should basically continue to enjoy the fact that your risk is going down Right, and and this could this happens in the stock market also. This happens in a variety of different situations in life. If there was ever a 
a, a perfect example of how risk compensation can drive irrational decision making. It was during this pandemic. People or states or towns, et cetera, were barely coming off of the recovery, you know, like in the recovery cycle, if you will. Um, and, and even though a lot of data has been put out about the lag factor, that if you are seeing cases now, um, then think about what's going to happen six weeks down the line, et cetera, et cetera. Even though lots of uh, articles have been written on that subject, but still, like March 23, Huntington Beach looked like that. Nobody's wearing a mask. Nobody is maintaining social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. April 15, Lansing, Michigan looked like that, where they were protesters. You know, they, they, that was more constitutional right driven. Um, the uh, Huntington Beach was just simply, <laughs> you know, uh, just want to enjoy the outdoors. But either way, these are all examples of risk compensation where um, as almost as soon as the perception of safety started in improving, people actually started taking on much greater risk than they would have, you know, otherwise or they wanted to uh, take throughout this whole pandemic. It's, it's possibly very irrational thinking. Um, next heuristic, base rate neglect fallacy. Sounds like a fancy name, but let me explain in plain English what it is. When you're judging the probability of an event, meaning could I get COVID, we tend to ignore general statistical information and focus instead on information related to this a specific case or only anecdotal you know, type of information, et cetera. We tend to be driven disproportionately by that. We tend to neglect the broader base rate statistics that, we should, that should ideally be influencing decision-making much more. Uh, one way to simply think about this is we forget to look at the forest or the trees. Um, and we're just literally not even looking at the trees, we're just looking at one tree and looking at one part of the tree and just like focusing on that. So one way to think about how this irrationally drove decision making, even within us on this call, ask yourself the question or two questions. Did your perceptions of COVID change when one of these following two scenarios happened in your life? Someone in your close circle, social circle, fell sick from COVID. And, um, and finally, it sunk in to say, maybe this thing is for real. You know, maybe I should be a little bit more serious or careful about this. Or somebody you don't know personally, but is well known, a celebrity, they actually not only got it, they were quite seriously ill and perhaps even died as a result. And now you're very surprised and taking it more seriously because if it can happen to that person who could afford any amount of, you know, any level of healthcare, they could pay for it. If it could happen to them, you know, it could happen to me too. So these are examples of how even many, many people, you know, even including people on this call might be using this kind of quick way of th thinking about what is my risk of getting COVID and how they're taking or not taking broader statistics or data into account. A lot of consumers would have done this uh, as a result of um, uh, as a result of these things with black cap fallacy. Uh, here's another heuristic uh, influencing not all consumers, uh, uh, but at least a large fraction of them. And also, it, this is only one example of how it would have tested. In, in, in decision making, there'll be many other examples too. The whole idea is non-regressive predictions. Back to uh, when you are making predictions of what could happen, you can sometimes make predictions that you're, if you're making intuitive gut-based decisions, options, you could be way off in your predictions. You could, um, you could basically be too low or too high and you're just like, whoa, like, you know, I, how did I get it so wrong? Uh, but it happens much more consistently than, than we think it would. It, and it happens to all of us or a lot of us. Uh, take, take one example of non-regressive predictions that were made on one topic or one subject. The subject is crime. In March alone, 2.5 million guns were purchased in the U.S. That number was up 85% versus March of 2019. In March some partial crime data is diametrically opposite. 
Chicago drug arrests were down 42%. LA crime was down 30%. USA study shows 19 out of 20 police agencies saw significant decrease in criminal uh, arrest, et cetera, et cetera. So what people predicted and acted as a result uh, on the basis of is almost diametrically opposite to what happened. So that was consumers. We've done government, we've done consumers. Um, I know we're on time. So if people have to run, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, but if you can't stay, uh, we do have a few more heuristics to explain how hospitals and possibly um, uh, other stakeholders have also um, been affected by irrational decision-making. Focusing effect heuristic, trying to explain hospital decision-making. Focusing effect is basically means that sometimes we focus too much on one piece of information and don't pay any attention to anything else, even when it's literally staring at us in the eye. There was a very famous experiment you might remember, uh, you might have read about it, heard about it, et cetera, where people were asked to watch a basketball game and they were asked to count the number of times or pay attention to the number of times uh, player A passed the ball to player B. In the middle of like an almost an hour long game, they many, many times inserted a picture of a gorilla in the middle of the screen when people are watching and not one single person saw it, the gorilla. They were so focused on, on seeing the passes that they were told to observe that they actually didn't, that, like, they didn't even, they, they couldn't like uh, 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 remember that it was even shown. The, everything that has happened on the topic of ventilators has been a fascinating uh, you know, uh, uh, the discussion and it's very much driven by focusing effect. To what extent did availability of ventilators in hospitals disproportionately drive policy decision making, at least in the first few weeks or whatever of the pandemic leading up to the lockdown? If you look at paper research that's coming out of Wuhan, um, and even an, uh, like information that was coming out in real time, cardiovascular symptoms, not just respiratory symptoms leading from pneumonia and others which would require a ventilator, but cardiovascular symptoms, uh, stroke, heart attack, et cetera, et cetera, or thrombo thrombosis related uh, complications were evident and even documented. Uh, even GI related symptoms that are emerging now were had also been documented. Maybe the incidence of, uh, was lower, but it wasn't like, you know, the, it, it, to, to obsessively focus on the respiratory symptoms and the ventilator dynamic or perhaps actually threw people off uh, uh, their track and, and um, you know, possibly lives were lost as a result of that. And certainly a lot of the decisions that were very heavily driven by capacity constraints in hospitals, especially ventilator constraints, capacity constraints, could have been, um, you know, like thought about differently. Also, now we do know, we didn't know this up, uh, uh, up front, we do know that forced ventilators are actually, you know, they have a lot of issues with them. We are, we're literally forcing air down somebody's uh, lungs. Um, but now we do know that 80 plus percent of patients who actually went on the ventilator did not survive. They could even be doing more harm than good possibly, or maybe the patient was already so far gone uh, that there was no, uh, you know, there was possibly no way to save them. Uh, we will find out more about that in the future, but at least this statistic is accurate as we stand right now in that, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's now becoming questionable on how much impact it truly even had. Another heuristic that seems to have driven uh, decision-making of at the hospital level in the kind of healthcare broader provider community, risk aversion. And what risk aversion means or how it influences decision-making is that we tend to be much more comfortable with like with a smaller risk reward trade-off. We'd much rather take a small gain if it comes with a small risk versus a much bigger gain because now if it comes with much bigger unknown risks that we don't know how to think about them or handle them, we get very quickly, we get nervous and we start making irrational decisions about how to think about that. And this is a very interesting uh, heuristic that has influenced the thinking or decision making at the health system and hospital level. If you lock down, you have implications. If you don't lock down, you have implications. How do you compare the risk reward trade off? The risk 
risk modeling if you do if you don't lock down you have data or whatever about how the infection is spreading and how many people are possibly dying the, those seem better knowns and better uh, like risks that we know and understand better and we can possibly attack them in a better way um, the other risks are much more complex and unknown so what is the overall impact of the lockdown, the downside risk on population health as a result of domestic violence resulting from lockdown, substance abuse, suicide, mental health unaddressed issues, cardiovascular events happening that could have been avoided. You can go on and on, you get the point. Um, it is so difficult or even impossible to basically put a value on that or model that and that you essentially don't do it and that should on at least at some level. So this risk reversion heuristic had a big role to play in how the systems uh, basically operated during this whole process. Um, last one on hospitals. Uh, optimism bias, it's something that didn't happen just now. It is something that's been happening for the last five or 10 years in the hospital industry. And it's not something that they would outright admit to, well, almost nobody would admit to any of these things <laughs> that we are proposing here because it's all about the reality of decision making. But um, if you look at what has happened in the hospital industry over the last um, uh, number of uh, years, consolidation of hospital systems, shutting down inefficient hospitals and branches, buying physicians practices, integrating them into the hospitals, reduction of hospital bed and ICU capacity, pushing outpatient care, even community clinics, et cetera, et cetera, pushing almost the patient away uh, from the hospital to some other location and only bringing in patients to the hospital who the hospital wants. Patients who are actually elect, are going to elective procedures or surgeries, expensive procedures, specialty care, that's what they want. They want to be in, in like, they want to operate like a restaurant where we want to see people at the times we want to see people, and then we want you out of here quickly too. <laughs> we don't want you staying here too long. Uh, so they, that all of that business model is actually diametrically opposite to what is needed in a, in a community spread infectious pandemic. And, and so that by default says that the industry was operating on a quote unquote optimism bias that something like that, that kind of broad scale event is not gonna happen. Any, any time in the near future. And therefore we can continue building out our business model that you know, makes us more money. <clears throat> Last few heuristics quickly. React, we're moving to media. We'll have a couple of uh, heuristics for the media and then it, um, um, uh, if possible time allows, we'll do uh, a couple of heuristics for experts. Um, reactance effects, uh, effect basically means sometimes humans have the exact opposite response to what you asked them to do or what you wanted them to do. Uh, it's like almost like if you, any of you remember the Seinfeld episode about <laughs> where it's like every instinct George Costanza has is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. That's basically an example of the reactance effect. Um, the media was influenced by reactance effect. And, and here's how. The White House made a whole bunch of mistakes in sending out mixed signals, whether it's because of escalation of commitments, whether it's because of commitment bias, whatever the reasons were we discussed earlier. The media further amplified those mistakes and the mixed signals were made even worse because now not only are you reporting on that, you're also reporting the fact that White House isn't saying these, all these crazy things or making mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. And, to, and Americans, consumers who like are already are overwhelmed, bombarded with information, don't know what's the right thing to do. Um, and, and their uncle is telling them something on WhatsApp, they, you know, and they're further confused. Now they don't, and you know, they kind of become even more paralyzed or, or they uh, downright make wrong decisions. So in the world of clickbait, reactance effect can help you come up with very, you know, uh, sensationalized headlines that can get you clicks and the media uh, industry wants that. And you know you can't blame them for that. They have to run a business also. But uh, because of reactance effect, which was partially in their control, they, they might have done some harm too. 
um, another heuristic that the media ended up using uh, and perhaps irrational decision making uh, here as well is commission bias. And here's how commission bias influences decision making. Sometimes the right thing to do is to do nothing. And, and just, you know, ignore it or whatever, just sit on it, but you feel the pressure or you feel the need to do something. You, you know the phrase, something is better than nothing, right? I mean, um, a lot of times physicians will even use commission bias. If a patient goes to see them and if they really want to say to the patient, you really don't need to be on any meds. It is very difficult for the physician to say that to a patient because they're come to my practice. How can I say them, <laughs> that to them, right? So um, in the last five, 10 years, there's been a very strong growing trend in the academic world on free access to research papers through preprints, preprint servers. And the publishing houses don't like it, but the research community loves it because now they get to like really access research much more quickly and much more uh, you know, in an unconstrained manner. And there's been unprecedented coordination in the research community. Uh, as soon as COVID broke, uh, this number might be actually be too low now. There are over 10, 20,000 plus research papers on COVID in less than four months, which is unbelievable. That's never happened in the history of research. But a lot of them are not even peer reviewed yet. And there's a whole process in academia for them to beat each other up <laughs> and survival of the fittest kind of, you know, mechanism that is built in research for only the best, you know, best research to actually fittest research to emerge out of that. And that process has been bypassed. And, 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 and uh, media especially has basically been reporting on a lot of this kind of research papers that are coming out that are basically, they will be retracted. Once they're peer reviewed, they will be challenged, they'll be retracted, they'll be amended or uh, will be altered. And, and that, by that time, the average consumer who had been exposed to this, you know, they're not going to pay attention to any of that and they, they would have made kind of irrational or bad decisions already. Um, two heuristics that influenced academic experts, especially those advising policy decision makers, uh, modeling epidemiological modeling experts, or, you know, people like that. Um, attribute substitution is a heuristic which basically you can understand the following way. It means you substitute what should have done with what you can do. Now you could say, what's wrong with that? I, if, I, if I did my best, you know, then, then that's like, you know, why didn't I do that? I couldn't do what I needed to do, but I did my best. That would be hard to argue. But there are many times you actually don't even try your best. You just do what is easy to do. You substitute what you can easily do with what you actually needed to do. And then you go through a whole bunch of rationalization in your mind that you did, the, you did you know, something to solve the problem. Reality was you may have done something, but, <laughs> but nowhere close to what you needed to do. Um, so one of the ways this heuristic manifested itself during the pandemic is a lot of decisions were made on models that were put out. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Imperial College model from UK, many, many other models, the Harvard, you know, et cetera, et cetera models. We're not here to discuss the, the actual pros and cons of each model. The, but the, the fact is a lot of those models are not taking into account when they're simulating the scenarios, what is the economic impact of the healthcare decisions you're making? And, and that kind of modeling is really what is needed. So it, in fact, we an, anticipate that that field is going to explode in the future, whether the next pandemic comes you know, a few years from today or a hundred years from today, matter, it's going to become necessary or mandatory. Uh, it was unfortunately not done. Now we could say, look, there was no time to do that. That, was, that is a much larger undertaking and you know, could never have been completed in the amount of time that uh, Cuomo needed to make decisions about near hospitals, right? And there would be a good point to that, but um, the, uh, I'm not even sure how much attempt was made to do this. Last heuristic, also applicable to, um, to experts in the, in the in modeling field, availability heuristic basically means sometimes you make decisions, information that is more easily and more frequently available to you becomes more important information just the mere availability of it makes it important that should not happen. 
important information is important information, available information is, is just available. It doesn't necessarily become more important. And this heuristic also drove um, decision-making for experts. If you follow the timeline of how information came out, whether it was on the Princess Cruise or from certain whatever in Japan, or it was a certain, uh, you know, like a, a you know, part of the hospital in Wuhan, it was whatever latest information was coming out was disproportionately driving modeling inputs. And people would say, I'm using what I can, this is all available, and that would be fair, but the alternative of not using that information and perhaps waiting might have been a better alternative at the end of the day. So, you know, that's something that uh, people can debate, but this is, um, this is um, the last heuristic that we wanted to uh, present to you and uh, in the context of how it uh, affected decision making for um, for academic experts advising policy decision makers. So um, this is a, a, an interesting field, behavioral science. It can help explain human decision making and especially the irrationality of it. Hope you enjoyed uh, this webinar. Learn something new about um, uh, about everything that has gone on in this pandemic. We thank you for joining and uh, appreciate your time.